like, well, why do I love the music industry so much? Yeah. And it, it was the simple fact that it was creative freedom. It was expression. Mm -hmm. And I was like, so I'm really not moving away from my identity. Mm -hmm. I am still doing creative expression and creative freedom and helping others produce more of that same expression mm -hmm. to impact more people. Hi, I'm Ebony and I believe that stories change lives and everyone has a story worth telling. Sometimes, unfortunately, we let our self-doubt get in the way of us writing our stories and sharing our stories. So that's why I created Motivation to Write as a source of motivation and inspiration to help writers like you and me share our stories with the world. So I talk to the experts ranging from entrepreneurs to marketers to, to authors to uh, therapists to psychologists who share their knowledge and their advice to help writers like you and me step into our full potential. Haley Kalini is a high-performance creative coach who helps mission-driven entrepreneurs create more time, impact, and abundance. Growing up, Haley was diagnosed with a plastic anemia, but she wasn't defeated. Instead, Haley chose to see life in a new light. She decided to never settle for less and to help others live a life of passion and abundance. Since then, Haley continues to help people think outside the box, share their gifts, and expand their reach. I am here with Haley Kalani, and I am super excited to have her today. How are you, Haley? <laughs> I'm so good. Thank you so much, Ebony. I'm really good and I'm excited to be here too. Yeah. So Haley is a content coach at Kalani Consulting mm -hmm. and she, I'm going to read this because this is, I got this straight off your uh, website. You turn small business owners, solopreneurs, and freelancers into content creators that generate fast attention and more revenue for their brand so they can do what they do best, help more people. And that's yes. exactly what we want because I know a lot of my um, audience and readers, they are writers or bloggers themselves. And yeah, they're interested in how to gain more readership and how to create wonderful content to generate that attention. So Haley, can you tell us a little bit about your path to becoming a content coach? Yeah, absolutely. The path that got me here is like, Nothing I would have ever thought <laughs> because when I was younger, I definitely never, I didn't really know about the world of entrepreneurship. You know, I was just some eight year old kid enjoying life. And I also never thought my, that I would be in business. I was always very creative, like very right brained, loved nature, loved having no schedule, no plans, no nothing. And so that was like the opposite of what it means to run your own business. Yeah. And so what happened was I always knew that I wanted to do something creative. I always knew that if I was going to do anything in life, I wanted it to be fulfilling for me. I wanted it to make me happy. And that was, you know, very prevalent in my childhood all the way up through high school and beyond. And when I knew I wanted to help people was after an experience that I had when I was younger. So I was about eight years old when I got diagnosed with a plastic anemia. Um, I'm in remission now, so it's all good. Oh. But at the time, you know, I was in and out of the hospital for a period of you know, several years. And I had amazing doctors and nurses come and take care of me, not only, but also heal me and cure me. And they worked night and day and were, you know, I was not their only patient. They were doing this all day, every day for hundreds and hundreds of people. Haley, can you explain what that is for our listeners? Oh yeah. So aplastic anemia is an autoimmune disorder where your good cells are attacking each other. Mm -hmm. So it was sort of like the world was in a global pandemic, but it was only for me. Right? <laughs> so it was very similar to what we have to do now. So my parents, they had to either quarantine or wear essentially what looked like hazmat suits in order to come into my room wow. because whatever germs, whatever little you know bugs floating around in the air or on surfaces could be really detrimental. If I got sick, it was like really sick. Mm. And so I had to be very careful going out to grocery stores, couldn't buy any fruits without really thick skin or peels on it. Mm -hmm. Couldn't go eat 
deli meats or fish or anything and couldn't go to school. So my parents had to pretty much their lives were on pause, had to figure out a school solution for me, how to pay for you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in medical bills and surgeries and just crazy stuff. And throughout that whole experience, the main thing that it taught me was that I don't want to settle for anything and I want to go live life to the fullest. And if that many people, those doctors and nurses could help me, I wanted to in turn help other people in some way, shape or form with my unique gifts. You know, their unique gifts were healing people, understanding the body, understanding all these diseases. And my gift was, well, I didn't know yet. <laughs> I was, I figure it out. I was like, well, <laughs> I'll probably figure it out. <laughs> I was like leaning like, what was their gift? What I was know, their right? gift? <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Connecting the dots, you know, as of now, it was really thinking big, thinking outside of the box, thinking about the future, envisioning, creativity, all of that. Uh, but at the time, yeah, I was super clueless. So I just went through high school um, after I was put into remission and I really fell in love with music. That was a creative outlet of mine that I thought for sure I was going to pursue to the end of time. And I still love music for sure. Haley, I was but, actually going to ask you about that because I did a little research and I found some like SoundCloud stuff. And I was like, is this, <laughs> is this Haley, the Haley I'm going to talk to? <laughs> That's wild. That is so funny. Okay. So <laughs> you, were you a music producer or you're a musician? What? I was a little bit of both. So in high okay. school, I played guitar. Um, in middle school, I was in like cover bands with this company called School of Rock. It was awesome. Oh, like, like the movie? Yeah, yeah, I was in the real life school of rock. <laughs> it was so fun. That's my favorite, one of my favorite movies. Me too. Yeah. And we would play, you know, stages, cover bands, and I had a great time. But then I started to realize, you know, being an introvert and wanting to be in charge of the creation process, I was like, you know what? Let me look at what goes on behind the scenes before the music is played on stage before the music is ever created. Like, how do people create these songs? That's when I really fell into the production side, um, music production and, and writing songs and all of that. And so I got my first job, 16 years old. I worked at like a kid's birthday party place, uh, saved up all my own money and just bought a bunch of audio equipment wow. and learned as I go. I was like, you know what? YouTube is around, so that will be my teacher. And that's what I did. Mm. And I really fell in love with it. And so when I graduated high school, there was a recording studio that had a certification program to become an audio engineer and work with musicians. And this was a recording studio in Seattle, Washington called Robert Lang Studios. They're incredible. They are known for Nirvana and the Foo Fighters and Soundgarden and Heart and just incredible, incredible bands. And so I had the opportunity to go there. My parents somehow managed to pay up the into uh, not the intuition the tuition yeah. <laughs> and I was so stoked I was okay. like but you oh, know as a musician God. you need a lot of intuition especially when you're you know a jazz musician doing improv and any musician really needs intuition so you're you're all you're okay <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's true it's true yeah and uh when that happened I was just so stoked to be there or surrounded by people who were just so talented yeah. in what they did. And after I finished the program, they actually hired me on as an audio engineer. Uh, and they also hired me on as a you know social media person. So somebody to help out with their content so that they could bring more people into the studio. And I was just experimenting, playing around, being like, all right, what do I do? And one thing that kept happening over and over again is I would either assist on sessions or, you know, meet people who were so talented at what they did, but they could not make a dime off their music or their job or their skill. Right. And I was like, that sucks. And it was including me too. Like I wasn't getting paid. I was pretty much unpaid to working at the studio. And then I had a, you know, a separate job, but my goodness, it broke my heart because I thought if you were able to just reach the right eyes and ears, people would fall in love with your music. and then. Eventually, I came across a mentor. She was part of the studio um, family, so to speak. And so she was a music lawyer and she owned an entertainment company. Mm -hmm. She took me under her wing and she shared a lot about 
business and entrepreneurship with me. Mm. And she opened up this whole world. And I was like, oh, my God, I can monetize my skills. You're kidding. And so that's when I decided, all right, cool. I'm going to work with musicians because that's where I'm at at the moment. And I'm going to help them with their social media. And I thought that's what I wanted. And I did that for a while. And it was cool. You know, I made a lot of good connections. But at the end of the day, I just felt a little bit unfulfilled because I wasn't part of that creation process, right? Again, that was like, I wanted to see the ideas in my mind and in other people's minds come to life. Mm -hmm. And so I pivoted. And right when I pivoted is when I would say it was like a month or two prior to COVID when like, Everything, you know, shit hit the fan and, and the whole world was in a state of chaos. Mm -hmm. So in the midst of pivoting, in the midst of figuring out what I'm doing, in the midst of a pandemic, I lost all my clients because I was no longer doing what they needed. And even if I did, they can post themselves. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily worth at that time, it wasn't worth hiring, you know, me as a beginning social media manager. Right. So. After that happened, I, I, I was pivoting, figuring out what I wanted to do, and I knew it was content. I knew it was something about the creation process. I knew it was putting together either a piece of writing, a piece of art, a video, something that could strike emotion in other people in mm -hmm. order to really resonate with them mm -hmm. across the screen. Mm -hmm. And that's what I did. That's what I kept doing and pursuing and testing and figuring out, okay, is this going to work? And I branched out of the music industry it it I felt like at that time the music industry was part of my identity mm -hmm. and it was cool but it wasn't necessarily healthy and so I felt as I was separating from the music industry that my identity was falling apart too mm. I was like well why do I love the music industry so much yeah and it, it was the simple fact that it was creative freedom it was expression mm -hmm. and I was like so I'm really not moving away from my identity Mm -hmm. I am still doing creative expression and creative freedom and helping others produce more of that same expression mm -hmm. to impact more people. Mm -hmm. And then it brought me back to, you know, my, my early days of being in the hospital and having all those people surrounded by me. And I wanted to help more mission driven people. Mm -hmm. So anybody under the sun that was looking to impact another person positively, I was like, all right, you and I will be a perfect match. Like let's let's reach more of the right people to spread that message. So that was a long winded <laughs> answer <laughs> into how the heck I'm sitting in front of you. Well, listen, that is that's so. Uh, I love that story because it's so similar to this uh, uh, another marketer I s spoke with. Her name is Richelli Wright. A few months ago, she started out also as a musician working in the studio, like helping. Uh, musicians get the word out about their music and that's how she got into marketing and she has her own company uh, like you so and you guys kind of have the same vibe too, the same look and everything so it's just it's so interesting um, how you can start off in one area of um, study like music or even culinary arts or whatever and then in studying that or in working in that field, like you see an opportunity for something else or you, you learn a skill or you discover a skill that you have that you can develop that can turn into something else. So like your creativity in that music space opened up this new world for your um, content creation consulting business, which is wonderful. I love that. And even in your the illness, that's just there's like a blessing in the illness because it was during that time in the hospital that you also recognize, hey, I, I think I have a gift of thinking outside the box and I want to help people too. So beautiful story, Haley. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah, Haley, thank you. Um, how can we as bloggers kind of tap into this creativity? Because I know a lot of writers just think, I don't, I'm not a musician like Haley. Like, how can I even begin to think the way she thinks and create this wonderful content? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's different for every person, which is probably not what we want to hear, right? We're like, no, give me an exact equation, A plus B equals C. Like, this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah. Uh, but it doesn't quite work like that, unfortunately. And I've had to figure out my own ways of increasing my own creativity and thinking 
more openly. And there's a couple things that we can all do to enhance that creativity, that adaptability, you know, all of the out of the box thinking. Yeah. And then there's some stuff that inhibits that creativity, mm -hmm. stuff that really suppresses it. And one thing that is really common for our society is that overall creativity is pretty suppressed because if we think about it as kids, you know, right around the age of when, instead of being in kindergarten and just playing all the time and coloring and all that, we move into then first grade, second grade, third grade and beyond where we're expected to sit down, learn, be quiet, follow rules. It's very structured. What does that sound like? That sounds like our left brain thinking. We've been designed and taught how to use our left brains more than our right brain. Yeah. And our right brain is that creative, that intuitive, beautiful, vast uh, side of our brain that is capable of envisioning things that don't exist yet, which is crazy. Mm -hmm. So I think that it comes down to, okay, knowing that creativity is a muscle mm -hmm. and it's something that we have to use more and more and more in order to get stronger, in order to get faster, mm -hmm. in order to be more comfortable. Right. And as I think it's just atrophied, right? Because ever since we were kids, we don't use it as often. So to strengthen that creativity muscle, what I like to do most often um, is incorporate play. Mm -hmm. And play is when we think of play, it's like, oh, okay, that's for kids. Like, what am I going to go jump rope or climb some trees? It's like, I don't know. Does jump <laughs> roping make you happy? Does climbing trees make you happy? Then maybe. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's something that we have to get away from as a frivolous, quote unquote, activity. Right. When in reality, it has a lot of amazing benefits. So f play is just something that we do for the sake of doing. Mm. no rhyme or reason, no outcome, just doing. Um, so for me, I love getting outside. I'm a very, uh, there, there's different play types, so yeah. to speak. Yeah. Um, and I am a kinesthetic. So I love to move, like mm. give me a box to jump over. I love CrossFit. I love MMA. I love sports and all of these things. And so that's my version of play. Somebody else might be like, ew, no, I don't. I don't <laughs> want to play like that. So it depends. Yeah. Maybe yours is drawing. Maybe yours is, I don't know, just sitting in silence, whatever it is. Doing more of that will in turn increase your uh, creativity. So um, one other thing too. I Jeff Harry. Do you know Jeff Harry? Yeah. <laughs> He's I was, you will not believe yeah. this. I just interviewed him yesterday. <laughs> No. And I'm like, yes, I did. And I was like, this sounds just like Jeff, because we just had a conversation about play and how important it is in just helping unleash the creativity within us. And yeah, you're you're so right. If we if we learn to just find if we learn to find, if we if we can find that um, one little thing that we like to do that just brings us pure joy that can help relax us and kind of bring us into this state where we're just more open to creativity. Yeah, exactly. That is so wild that you talked to him yesterday. Um, <laughs> he is, he's a mentor of mine uh, currently. Yeah, 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 yeah. We met through a, a mutual friend and as soon as I met him, I was like, I got to have, I got to get this guy on my side so that I can learn more about <laughs> creativity and how to do my job better. Um, but yeah, that's so wild. He, he's yeah. incredible. He'll tell you way more benefits about play than I ever could, but yeah. <laughs> You're doing a great job though. Yeah, that's a wonderful point you make. And I love the point that you make about creativity being a muscle that you just got to practice it to to really um, to just get better at it because yeah, a lot of people kind of um, assume that creativity, it's like you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case at all. It's something that can be developed. So that's, that's wonderful. Can I ask you something, um, Haley? When, so let's say that um, you have someone like a writer who is feeling like, okay, I think I can, I think I can try this creativity stuff out. 
um, and they have a blog. There are so many different options they can do as far as like expressing that creativity. They can express it in their writing. They could do videos. They could do a podcast. They could create a course. They can, how, how do they start to um, narrow down like what they should be focusing on? Does that depend on like their niche? niche niche whatever you call it <laughs> <laughs> i think it's both and um yeah i think that the easiest way to narrow down is to figure out first what don't you like like what is right off the bat nope don't want to do that for me it was like i just don't really want to share about my morning routine for example mm -hmm. um and i think that w it comes back to we see so many other people doing X, Y, Z for their marketing or X, Y, Z for their yeah. blog or, you know, their personal brand. Yeah. And we think, oh, that's working for them. I'm going to try that. Yeah. And then we do. And either it just doesn't work yeah. or we try it and we burn out because it wasn't in alignment with us mm. as people, as learners, as productive workers. So I would start with the things that you know aren't going to serve you um, and aren't serving your the things that you like. You right, know? right. And then say, okay, now that I know what I don't want, right. what's left? Mm -hmm. uh, what does interest me? And I would start with maybe the values. So yes. whatever values that you hold near and dear, starting there yeah. and saying, okay, now that I know what I don't like, what I do like, and what my values are, how can I best impact my ideal audience or my core community, whoever that person or those people are. Mm -hmm. And when we ask ourselves that question next of how can I best impact them, it usually leads to, well, where are they, right? Where, where are they? What do they need most right now from me? And depending on those two answers, it's going to then lead into, all right, well, how do I actually reach them? Mm -hmm. What do they find engaging? Like, what? how can I pop up in front of their eyes in a way that they're like, oh, this is interesting. Oh, this speaks to me. Oh, I love this. Mm -hmm. So starting there. And sometimes it goes with experimenting. I have a thing called the creatific method, which is a made up word um, for the scientific method. Right. And scientific method we've got those seven steps question research experiment blah 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 all the way until you get to a conclusion and then you repeat whatever mm -hmm. you found right yeah so then it comes into the experiment process like if you think videos might be your thing try five minute videos try five second videos if you think drawing is going to be part of your process um, try drawing on sticky notes versus a big whiteboard, right? Mm -hmm. So it just depends on the different ways that we can get our ideas out mm -hmm. uh, because it's all swimming around here up in our head. Right. And there's so many different ways that we can spit it out either through our mouth or our words or our art. So right. that's where I would start. Right. And does um, does what you do as far as content creation it, it depends a lot on who you're speaking to so I guess my question is how does one um, learn exactly who their audience is because a lot of times we start things like blogs and we don't quite know who they are and I don't necessarily mean just demographically although that's very important but even what they need or want because a lot of times we start blogs based on what we like to do and so it's kind of hard for the beginning blogger to find people who are like-minded who will be attracted to what they do. So how do we get their attention? Yeah, that's a super, super common um, issue that comes up for anybody who's got their personal brand, especially you know, writing yeah. a blog about certain topics, right? So I think, one, it starts with us. Again, I, every, everything that we do is always going to stem from us first. Mm -hmm. And it's going to stem from, especially our audience, it's first going to stem from our why. Mm -hmm. like why does my brand even exist in the first place? Or why does my blog even exist in the first place? And once we answer that question, let's say your blog is about um, healthy, gluten-free eating, for example. So it's healthy, gluten-free eating. Why? Am I writing about this? Probably because I want to help other people who can't eat gluten 
not have to feel like there's only bland foods to eat. Like, no, I want to show them that it's possible to, to create amazing meals and to meal prep and not have to worry about, you know, X, Y, Z. Yeah. That is where I would start is like the why. Okay. The impact that we want to have on people. And then it's sort of working backwards from there. Okay. So if we want to help people who are gluten-free to, to expand their palate or whatever, Mm -hmm. then who are people that are gluten-free? Like, what do they deal with? What kind of problems do they deal with? What kind of uh, life do they typically live? And again, that probably comes from experience. Like if you're writing about being gluten-free, but you're not gluten-free, that's a little, you you don't have that perspective, right? Um, So same thing for me, when I talk about being creative, creating content, it's because I want to impact the way that we resonate with other people on the other side of the screen and bring businesses closer together with their members. Okay. So that would be my why. And then I'd work backwards and go, okay, well, who creates content? <laughs> right? Marketers, solopreneurs, business owners, those are the ones that need help the most. And then I'm like, all right, out of those people, like, what do they deal with on a daily basis? We're probably really stressed about, about trying to create content. They probably wake up in the morning and are like, oh, what am I going to post today? And yeah. so that's that process of starting. Okay. Now I, I'm understanding who my audience is really is right on a psychographic level yeah okay so that that actually makes sense and that aligns with what a lot of um people in your profession uh tell me is that you have to know your why right uh so know like your purpose what what do you want your 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 people to do think or feel after having come across your services or your content and then you 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 have to you then will think about uh, their pain points, the pain points that you're addressing in <clears throat> um, in the content that you're providing them, right? You have to know what they're having trouble with because essentially you're coming up with the solution for their problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. That makes sense. Um, in our content, because you mentioned in your own business, um, I don't know if this was if you were talking about your own business or your just marketing in general, but it sounded like you were kind of alluding to the fact that it's important that we're relatable. Like whatever we create that we can somehow our audience, we can relate with our audience's problem and then they can relate with us. Right. Mm-hmm. And we can start to build a relationship, a trust between us because yeah. that just. Yeah, how important? How can we start to build relationships with our audience via our content? Because I think a lot of people, when they hear that, they get a lot. Of, they get nervous because they think you have to be super, super vulnerable and share all your secrets. And <laughs> you know, people don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah. You don't want all your business out there, but you do want to <laughs> strengthen your relationship with your audience. Yes, I think the most important thing is just being transparent and and. It depends on your comfortable, your level of comfortability of how transparent you are being. But as long as you're being truthful and transparent, that's how you can start that relationship. And the best way I like to think about it is, you know, our audience should in some way, shape or form become our BFFs, like our best friends. Mm -hmm. And that makes me think of real life relationships. What does a real best friend relationship need? You need to have a two-way like conversation. You know, I'm giving you something. You guys are giving me something. And it's based on the foundations of trust and communication and authenticity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the fact that you guys love, you know, ice cream, going to the movies, X, Y, Z, right? You have common yeah. interests. Yeah. So I think that's where it starts, just being relatable as if it was a I mean, they are, they're real people, right? They're real people on the other side of the screen. And we forget that we get so overwhelmed with that number. And we're like, how do we relate with 5,000 or more people? And I said, well, they're just people at the end of the day. Right. And if you were to talk to somebody in real life, how would you talk to them? Right. And if they were dealing with a problem, how would you suggest dealing with that problem? Right. And also relating it back to our own stories. So Hmm. one thing that uh, I have a specific you know, for lack of a better word, equation that I use for my clients to create content that is always relatable to their end consumer, which is you take your ideal clients or customers specific problem 
or a specific situation that they face. Uh And you add that with your expertise or your experience. Mm -hmm. So when you combine those two things, no matter what, if you're talking about them and you're talking, you're relating it back to your expertise, Mm -hmm. you're always going to create value and you're always going to create a stronger bond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. So the, um, I love how you use that word transparent because I've, I've never heard a marketer use that word. But yeah, trans, being transparent is, is a wonderful way to, to build trust. And, and I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about how you can also build trust via the content that you put out, like the valuable content you put out. Because I think the more valuable content you put out, the more trust you build with the audience. Mm-hmm. I think a big thing about trust is knowing that I've got your back no matter what, right? Like that's a huge portion of trust. And one thing that screams mistrust or like, ooh, run away is when somebody is purposefully selling too much. And it's like, well, aren't I supposed to monetize what I'm doing? And, and you know, yes, yes, absolutely. We want calls to action. We want, you know, there, there's a reason why we're building this community so that they can invest in you and you can grow and they can grow. But at the same time, it's sort of an 80-20 rule. 80% of the content that we put out there should be purely value-based. That's how we're really going to build trust. We're really going to build a solid community of loyal people who are like, ah, this person is providing me value like every week, every day, however much. Yeah. And the other 20% is, you know, you got to get your product or your service or your blog out there, right? Mm -hmm. So then it's, lightly promoting whatever you have Mm -hmm. whatever you're selling whatever you're trying to teach people Mm -hmm. and that can be done in a very tasteful authentic transparent way of hey i've dealt with xyz problem before i know that you guys have dealt with xyz problem as well because either you've told me or i've spoken to people who have or blah 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 Mm -hmm. and i purposely created this solution for that xyz problem so here it is and if that resonates with you like talk to me or you know buy it or whatever it is whatever that call to action leads to yeah so i think it's that 80 20 rule is really important of mainly giving value mainly putting out um your feelers and and for trust and then the other 20 percent is all right look what i've made i've made this for you for a reason so here it is Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so when, at what point, so we've been putting out all this valuable, wonderful, creative content, and we've built trust with our audience. Um, when and how do we begin to monetize? So a lot of people want to start monetizing, but they are apprehensive because um, I think they're scared of rejection. Like if I put this out there, like no one's going to buy it, or you know, this, people are going to say it's too expensive. Or, so how... How do we ma- how do we begin to monetize? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, one thing that you said that that is so common is like oh, we're we're afraid of that rejection. We're afraid of like oh, what if nobody likes it or you know what if, what if somebody says it's too expensive or all these objections. Yeah. And I say, yo, that's gonna happen. Yeah. It's gonna happen. <laughs> You're probably gonna face all those problems, if not more. But I think those are always learning opportunities of, of, okay, they, I've had the objection of, oh, it's too expensive four, five, six, ten 10 times. So is it really expensive for what I'm offering or am I just not speaking to the right person willing to invest? Mm-hmm. So I think it's that that's one figuring it out. Um, but two, the actual monetization process, and I'm assuming you're talking more about blogs and stuff, right? Okay. So there's lots of different ways. One of the easiest and quickest, in my opinion, is sponsorships from other people or other companies and brands. And that really just begins with, okay, what aligns with you? What stuff do you actually use, whether it's tools, software, uh, pens, paper, anything that you enjoy, that you actually enjoy? Always start with if it's in alignment first. And then make a huge list of those brands and it can be a running list that you add to and reach out like you're gonna get 
responses uh, eventually. <laughs> and it, it might take, you know, 100, 200, 400 messages, mm -hmm. but eventually you'll get a response. And as you grow, the responses that you get back should also grow. Right. And I also think, too, that we want to go for the big kahuna as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. And I'm all for it. Like, try it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, try it, see what happens. Um, but also not being afraid to go for the micro-influencer that's got 5,000 followers who are dedicated as fuck. Like, I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed <laughs> to curse on you. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> who are, like, really dedicated yeah. and who would trust that person uh, or that brand or influencer or whatever to as, as a referral essentially right yeah, yeah so reaching out and making a list and and just keeping the momentum going so mm -hmm. that you don't feel like well five brands said no so i'm just gonna give up peace out right 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 yeah yeah okay that's that's great advice seeking sponsorships so literally you have to really pay attention to what it is um that you're that you're using on a daily basis for your blog you, you said it could be anything, the types of pins that you use when you're taking notes or the uh, even software that you use to create videos and stuff, right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. For example, you know, maybe you schedule your posts using Hootsuite. Maybe Hootsuite would be a good sponsorship for you. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Mm -hmm. um, what about if we want to um, like create some type of service like a course um that is paid for how what's your advice on how to get that rolling and how mm -hmm. to meet like the fear of <laughs> being laughed out out the room like who do you think you are to have a course because there's always that i think you even talk about it somewhere on one of your uh, posts like the inner critic that's always like really mm -hmm. like get over yourself <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah we all have that really loud inner critic yeah and it will come up and you know they i don't think it'll ever fully go away but it'll become more quiet eventually yeah. and eventually you can you know brush it aside but to answer your question um oh my gosh i'm losing what question what did, what did, what did you ask <laughs> i'm like you just asked it so if we have like we have an idea for a service we want to offer mm. how can mm -hmm. we kind of get that ball rolling should we we should probably test it out Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, definitely testing it out that it's hard to test it out because we want to get paid so quickly. We want to realize that what we got is a winner and we're, we're going to be able to scale it and get rich and like all this stuff. And we're like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not even on step one yet. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's okay. Let's figure out what we have first. So let's curate. Let's say it is a course. Um, First of all, you got to figure out, okay, well, how long does it need to be? And I think when we are figuring these things out, we usually think of it from the perspective of how will it serve us, mm -hmm. but we don't always think of it from the perspective of what's best for our client or customer. Mm -hmm. So the length of the program, the topics that are involved, the cost, all of that is from the perspective of the other client or customer. Yeah. So saying... All right, you know, for my example, my one-on-one -on -one coaching program is 90 days. I specifically made it for 90 days minimum because, you know, nobody's going to learn anything in 30 days to be able to really go out and execute on all the stuff that I have to teach. Mm -hmm. But I also don't need to keep somebody on for six plus months if they don't need me, right? Like my goal is to get you out of here as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. So 90 days was that for me. But I also had to test it. I did have, you know, a year long one on one coaching uh, client, but I also had a two month and a one month one on one coaching client. So it was experimenting and being okay with that too. Like, you don't have to build out your website with like six programs that you offer and have it all clear and concise and perfect in the beginning, right? So just testing it out, getting a group of, you know, if you do want to make a group coaching, um, program getting together four or five six people who you personally know who are willing to take a risk uh and support you either investment wise by paying you and saying yeah i'll i'll give you this money to teach me this thing or if you're able to i always recommend just doing it for free 
If it's your very first time doing it, get in there and do it for free. If it's something that you feel like you can't do for free, I personally don't believe that you believe in yourself enough. Mm. And by that, I mean, you got to know that what you have is so good that when you do it for free for somebody, they're going to pay you next time or they're going to tell somebody else to pay you. So do it for free for a group of people or just one person, depending on what your program is, and then get their feedback. Yeah. What was really good about it? What could have gone better? And also make sure you're providing feedback for yourself. Same right. questions. What could have I have done better? What could serve my client better? Yeah. So that's where I would start. Yeah. And I think like if people are wondering, well, where do I find people to even test it on? I think Meetup is a great place to to try something out like that. You start a Meetup group and, and you you know, you could start a meetup class, like you could, whatever you want to do on meetup. <laughs> and uh, you could test test your idea out there. And then you, afterwards, you give them a survey um, and ask them, you know, how to, what suggestions do you have? What would you like to see um, next time? Or what what really helped you? It didn't help you. And, and that, yeah, that would really give you a great idea. And after you've done that, you'll really know whether or not that's something you really want to do after you, you know, yes. run through it for free. Cause you might have this idea and then not even want to do it after <laughs> you've tried it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That is so true. Um, so I kind of, I, I really like what you said a little earlier in the conversation. I want to just kind of go back there cause we're kind of running low on time. I can't believe already. So, <laughs> but you said in the beginning when you were um, working in music and you were trying to find like your own audience and no one was really, you didn't feel people were really um, picking up on what you were throwing down, as they say. No one was picking up what I was throwing down. But you said, I just need to find the right people that will listen to my music. And you've, and that a theme has been repeated throughout this conversation. And I think that's so important because um, I think that as as writers and bloggers, if people are not responding to what we're putting out, we just we just think we suck. Like, mm-hmm. I must be horrible because no one's paying attention to me. No one's reading me. No one's commenting. Like, I would see it on, on Twitter all the time where people are like, is anyone even paying attention to my tweets? Is anyone reading my stuff? No one's responding <laughs> to me. And it's not that your stuff sucks at all. It's just that you have to find the right people to get in front of. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just a very important message that people need to hear. Like, you're not you're not sucky. I don't know if I just made up that word, but you know what? yeah. Yeah. That's a great point. Um, so I also want to talk about one more thing that you mentioned. Um, you said that when we are, I think we were talking about building trust and, and putting out content, how important it is for us to speak normally. You didn't mm-hmm. use the word normally, but just speak in like regular language. <laughs> Because I, I think, especially with writers, we kind of get way into our heads and we try to write really fancy and sound like we're some super duper smart person. And that, like when you're reading copy like that, it's just confusing. And <laughs> like, who is this person? It doesn't really make you relatable. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's tricky to find the right language because you're so right when And I had that same experience too when starting to really get into content. I would make videos or write stuff and it just, it was embellished, right? It's a lot of extra. And (laughs) brevity and simplicity are golden nuggets when it comes to content and marketing. Yeah. Yeah. Can you make it simple and can you make it easy to digest and consume? Yeah. And Yeah, of course, we want to look and sound smart and all this stuff, but hopefully we already believe in ourselves that we are smart. (laughs) We already do sound smart, you know, so being us is the more important thing. And finding, I think that finding our own tone, like how do we talk when we're talking to a best friend that needs our help? How do we talk to a close coworker that is recently going through a problem and they have come to us. Yeah. That's the tone that we want to convey in our content. Right. Close friend, close acquaintance, somebody that we can vibe with. Yeah. And then it's easier to differentiate when you do create a piece of content. Like, Ooh, am I being a little extra? Am I, am I trying to embellish too much? Or does this sound like something like I would say a really good uh, tip that one of my good friends, his name is, uh, AJ Shankar, and he's part of the Heart Centered 
sales specialists. Mm -hmm. And he said, to really get our tone out in the best way possible, we can do voice to text on either our phone or they even have it on, on like Google Docs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So voice to text, speak out what you think or speak out what you're trying to convey, I should say, and then edit it afterwards. So go in and add all your punctuation, spell check and everything. And, you know, if you need to move some stuff around, but that's your core tone because it's how you would normally speak. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, and, um, and in, cause I'm an English teacher and English, we call that the voice, like what's mm -hmm. your voice? Um, so yeah, you're, you're right. It is important to, because you're the voice you choose to write your copy. It's probably going to be different than the voice you're, you choose to write a letter to your governor or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Right. So yeah, that's, that's a great tip to actually record yourself. Um, Wow, so much I can so much more I kind of wanted to touch on. Okay, so let me let me talk about this also that you mentioned. Um you said that when you're you put out your content, you want to make sure that uh I'm trying to not put words in your mouth. Let me just wrote, let me just tell you what I wrote. You said <laughs> about relating it. back to your own story. So I think it's also an important point that you're making is that everything that we're doing as far as putting out content is telling a story and that that story that we're telling about, you know, our journey as a coach or our journey as a writer or journey as a musician or whatever, um, that that's everything that we put out kind of aligns with that story which would align with our why like why we're even telling that story and what pain points we're addressing with our audience via our story storytelling is, like this my point is storytelling telling is important in content creation mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's super important and it's something it's a skill for sure just like anything else is a skill and so it's something that we'll have to work on it's something i've had to work on a lot and i'm still working on uh is really how do i present this point that I'm trying to make, yeah. but turn it into a story. Yeah. And the best way that I've come across in doing that in also being super authentic is just telling my own story. Mm -hmm. I think always, always, always we can relate a real life experience that we have gone through mm -hmm. um, or have just been a bystander of or have witnessed, right? We can tell we can relate to that point to a certain story. Yeah. Um, and it's also really good too, because well, before I get too ahead of myself, because I don't want to jumble up my thoughts, but a really good way is to write, have a running idea list of content. Mm -hmm. You have the running idea list. Let's say something happens to you. You're driving on the, on the road. You go to the grocery store. Somebody, uh, I don't know, drops a bag of apples and you're like, oh my God, that made me think of this. <laughs> and you're like, that would be perfect to yes. this, this. Dropping the apples metaphor is perfect for talking about uh, food waste. I don't know. Yeah. And then when you write that down, you go down to sit, uh, you do go down to sit to create content later. You can relate the point of food waste to that experience of going to the grocery store and seeing somebody drop some apples. Yeah. So that's really what I mean by, by story and relating a piece of content or a point back to an actual experience. And the really cool part about that is what I was about to touch on earlier is it makes you a diamond in the rough mm -hmm. because nobody else on planet earth ever has or ever will be you like you will always be ebony there will no there's nobody else that will ever be you or will have a life experience that you have and so by creating your content specifically we're directly relating to your experiences and stories nobody else can replicate that you are by default unique you will stand out no matter what. And that is way more important than trying to be something else or trying to do what's popular. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great message. I was, uh, I had a conversation with the um, psychologist, doc, his name is Dr. Warren Davis, and he was talking about uniqueness. And I always assume that uh, your talents and your, your um, yeah, I guess your talents are what made you unique. And he's like, no, it's your experiences that make you unique. Mm -hmm. And it, which is exactly what you're saying. Yeah, no one is going to ever experience something the exact way you experienced it. And in that, in your perspective and, and um, re relationship with what happened is what makes you 
unique so that and I love how you you, you know mentioned just looking watching the apples fall like just little things that happen throughout our day can be great conversation starters for stories yes can be, you know they can serve as impetuses I don't know if I'm making up that plural world but they, they can serve as an impetus for stories that we can uh, use in our content that's that's great that's powerful mm -hmm. Haley this has been wonderful Great conversation. And yeah. did you notice that we're kind of uh, matching in color? I did. I know we've got like that same, like nice, I don't know if it's a mustard yellow. I don't know. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, I love how it matches your background too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. Yeah. Tell us where we can find you. Uh, you can find me. LinkedIn is my go-to place. It's where I put all of my best advice and tips and teachings on LinkedIn. So you can find me under Haley Kalani, H-A-Y-L-E-E-K-A-L-A-N-I. And you can also find me on my web website. So it's hkalaniconsulting.com. And other than that, you know, I'm on Instagram and Facebook. But if you just want to chat and hang out or ask me questions, LinkedIn is probably the best place to do that. Okay, great. And do you have any closing words of encouragement or wisdom for people who are kind of delving into creating content? Oh, man, there's probably so many things. Uh, <laughs> I, I would say to, you know, to keep it brief and short, yeah. brevity and simplicity, right? Yeah. Uh, really, hmm, hmm, how do I want to put this? Take your time. I want it to be good for your audience, Ebony. <laughs> I can edit. Take your time. <laughs> I can edit the wait time out. <laughs> That's so funny. There's like a five-minute pause. <laughs> I would say no matter what, understand and curate that identity of curiosity and learning. Because if we do that and we can cultivate that identity of curiosity and learning, we're never going to, oh, I shouldn't say never, but it's less likely to feel like we are incapable or uh, not as not good enough or like we shouldn't be in the room. Those feelings are going to dissolve because we can always learn. We can always grow. We will always get better. And knowing that six months from now, you're going to be way further than you were six months ago. Mm -hmm. And then a year from then, you're going to be way further than you were a year ago. And just really understanding that, like, all right, even on the days where I'm creating and I just feel like, ugh, it's not going the way that I want it or I don't really like what I'm creating. I don't know if other people will. Am I even supposed to be doing this? Remind yourself, yes, because it feels right in here, you know, our heart. And B, like, you're always going to become better. You're always going to meet other people that will shine a light on your strengths and who will teach you how to use them even better. Mm -hmm. So understand that it's, it's a constant growing process. And I don't think anybody's ever, even at the end of their days, uh, ever done growing. Wow. Famous last words. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Haley Kalini, I love her story. I love that she took the diagnosis and all of the, I'm sure a lot of suffering and pain that came with going through that um, disease of plastic anemia. And her company was birthed from that experience where she decided then that she wanted to live a full abundant life and help others do the same. So if you are an entrepreneur and you need or you need help with optimizing your time and how to create more flow into your business, I hope that you contact Haley. Please visit her website and her social media. And also visit my site, uzezo.com, to subscribe to my weekly newsletter. And you can find me on Twitter at Ebony Haywood. You can find me on um, Instagram and Facebook at Motivation to Write. And tune in next week. I have as a guest digital strategist, online business educator, and author, Dr. Sandra Coltrane Medi Medici. Medici. I think it's Medici. So um, I hope to see you next week for that conversation. Thank you so much and have a great weekend. <laughs>